Whenever anyone asked him about Zen, the great master, Guti, would quietly raise one finger into the air. A boy in the village began to imitate this behavior. Whenever he heard people talking about Guti's teachings, he would interrupt the discussion and raise his finger. Guti heard about the boy's mischief. When he saw him in the street, he seized him and cut off his finger. The boy cried and began to run off, but Guti called out to him. When the boy turned to look, Guti raised his finger into the air. At that moment, the boy became enlightened. In the course of a human being's life, one way or another, sometime or another, you consider what the journey's all about. What are we doing here? What is this all about? So what most people do is pick up a few books and they read them and they think, okay, I'll do that. I, I can buy that. They, they look at something that appeals to their logic and their reasoning. That's about as far as it ever goes. Direct experience? No, no. That's not something they want. They want something they can look at at a distance, maybe admire in their ego, in their mind, in their vanity, in their pride, but they never have the direct experience of it. And if a philosophy or a religion or even a politic uh, happens to appeal to your logic and reasoning, you think you understand it and it's macaroni. That's the way it ends. But there is more to life than all of that. And when Jesus talked about the idea of Letting the world not live in you, but you live in the world. Buddha said the same thing, and by the way, Lao Tzu did as well. They were talking about something very important, more than strategy. They were talking about living from love, which is what this life is all about. But then again, love is a philosophy to most people. They don't really understand love because love cannot be understood. The love that I understand in my mind cannot possibly be love. What is love then? It is that direct experience. It is coming to the totality of your being, coming to the totality of your essence, and it is allowing that totality to have being in me and in you. And when it has being, then we can move forward into our life. The story I'm about to give you from Zen Flesh, Zen Bones, is a story of a little boy who was sitting in a zendo. He was studying Zen. And in the days that Zen Flesh, Zen Bones were written, a lot of young people went to study Zen. The master would make a gesture deliberately with his finger. And he would stick it out like this when he was making a certain point. Now, what was the finger pointing all about? It was a gesture of the master from his heart to his body. This gesture is not to be taken lightly. Listening to a discourse, listening to what I'm giving to you right now is a very difficult thing because the mind is always looking for the punchline, the gag line, something that it can grasp onto and say, oh, I get that, I understand that, that's what he means. And if it's something you like, then you mimic it. And if it's something you don't like, we make fun of it. So that's either imitation or we're mocking it. Neither way is very good. In the story, this little boy used to like, when the master wasn't around, to mimic the master. And he would stand there among the other students and start talking, imitating the master, and sticking his finger out like that, just like the master would. And of course, everybody got a big chuckle out of it. They thought it was really funny. But in the story, it turns a little bit. Let me tell you what the meaning of real life is. It's about a certain quality of sincerity. You can have all the philosophy in the world you want, all the things in, you in the world that you think are important and they're not important. The only thing in life that is really important that will give you direct experience is the sincerity to be devoted to a practice even when the going gets rough. When people are having difficulty in a spiritual practice, they usually quit. When you're in a potent one, one where you're meditating, like the one I offer with Tibetan 
uh, bells and Tibetan pulsing meditations. This is potent stuff. You start feeling and developing inside of you an energy. This energy is about love. My mind is filled with fear. In fact, every thought I have is based in fear. Fear of my survival, fear of doing something wrong, fear of not knowing what the rules are. People love to have rules. And if you give them rules, you tell them, this is what you do, this is what you don't do, this is when you do it, this is when you don't do it, then people think, oh, wow, there it is. It's all laid out. All I got to do is no brainer, follow the rules. But it really doesn't work like that because you can follow the rules. You can get everything that you've ever wanted in your life by following the rules and still find yourself lost and deeply afraid. You can still find your mind chugging on with thoughts. My Gregory Penn thoughts are based in fear. They're based in woundedness, in the schizophrenia, as it were, a sociopath. It can be in all sorts of things in our brain, but that doesn't mean that's who we really are. Once you recognize what a thought is, you will no longer be much interested in them. But there is a slippery slope here that the ego gets involved in. The minute it starts realizing that you're meditating, that you're starting to truly work upon yourself, it will start to mimic. There is nothing more dangerous than the spiritual ego. Lots of students develop the spiritual ego before they develop anything else. And I find it becomes a shield around them. Something that they think insulates them from, well, being criticized. They are always looking for self-righteousness and not the humility that would bring them to the direct experience that a real authentic spiritual practice is all about. If I start looking at my life from the point of view of just thought, I can only mimic. People read. They listen to people and develop knowledge. And they look for gurus and people to be their spiritual leader. But in doing so, they lose themselves. They lose who they are, what they are, where they come from. They lose authenticity. That thing that I called about a little earlier in this little discourse, sincerity. When I am deeply sincere... There is a devotion that is taking place. And that devotion is extremely important. We're going to talk about devotion in the next half. About this little boy who the master cut his finger off. So... I'd like to talk a little bit here about what it means to be devoted and why cutting off the finger of the little child was so important. Now, this is absolutely out of the box for most of you, and you're going to have to understand devotion to a spiritual practice means total devotion. The reason why we in America seem to be rather spiritless is because we only devote a very small portion of our life. It's more like a donation, a contribution, a tax-deductible gift that we give to our spiritual practice. We really don't give our whole self to it. Students tell me they, they have, but when it gets down to the nitty-gritty, they don't. What does it mean to be total in a spiritual practice? It doesn't mean that you're devoted to um, drinking the Kool-Aid. It has nothing to do with that. It is about one thing. I am devoted to love. And I will do anything I can to let love live me. Now hear that. I will do anything I can to let love live me. What does that mean? It means I have to be willing to sacrifice my vanity, my pride, my thoughts, my arrogance, my anger, my self-righteousness, my hate. I have to be willing to let those take maybe second or third place in my life. And no matter what it is I must do to let love live me, I have to be willing to do it. Now, what would that look like? Well, in the case of this little boy, it was his finger. The master knew the boy had talent. This kid was very special. And the master knew his uniqueness so what he did was, when he found an opening, and I've been with Zen masters like this, when they find an opening, 
and they see where they can get to you, right away they do it. What did this master do? When the little boy was mimicking one last time, the master came over, grabbed him, took out a knife, cut his finger off, and threw it away. The shock. You have to understand the shock. The shock waves probably went through him as did the whole audience that saw what was going on. The child ran away screaming and crying. The master looks at him and says, stop. Everything stopped. The mind stopped. The body stopped. The emotions stopped. Everything stopped. And in that moment, the little boy, out of habit, lifted his finger up. But there was no finger to lift up. In that moment, his mind stopped and he was awakened. This little boy became, eventually, one of the greatest Zen masters that ever lived in Japan. All because of that moment. Now you're looking at it going, I don't know, I don't, I don't want any part of anything like that. I'm not asking you to. I'm not going to go cut your finger off. That's not the point. But the point is when the mind stops, and sometimes there are great difficulties in our life, and when they come, if we stop and we don't look at them and go, how am I going to get through this? Why did this happen to me? Which are very selfish questions. Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? We stop. Observe. Watch the mind. Watch and see how your heart will pop out. How you will begin to see intuitively exactly what you need to see in the moment you need to see it without the need for anyone telling you, well, the teacher says you should do this and the doctrine says you should do that and the religion tells you you shouldn't do this. No, there are no rules anymore. Now you're living by intuition. You're not living by impulse or mania, but the intuition. Your mind pops open, and all of a sudden, you get the bigger picture of it all. Once you get that bigger picture, once you're aware of what's really going on, you begin to see the ludicrousy of living any other way but in the nature and the harmony of the heart. For a lot of people, this just really isn't possible. People are pretty far gone these days. I'm not going to sit here and paint a picture for you that we're all doing really well in this world and that the things that we are going through in our life are just simple. They're not. There's alcoholism to deal with. There's drug addiction. There's marijuana. There's obsession, compulsion with sports, the mania of sports, alcoholism. I could go on and on and on. Money problems. It's going to be very difficult to turn that kind of boat around and do anything significant with our life. But there are a few of you out there who get it. You understand, yes, yes, I understand what he's saying. The devotion to the practice to make love possible, to let love live me. No matter what I have to give up, even if it were a finger, no matter what I would have to do, maybe I'd have to be embarrassed, humiliate myself by saying, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Things like that. Those are ways in which the finger are cut off. Whatever it is that would be significant to your ego, if you were willing to metaphorically cut it off, you might find inside yourself a brand new way of approaching your life. It isn't about being perfect. It's really about just being available. Available to love in all of its forms, in all of its ways, to forgive and let love live you. That is a real, real, real spiritual practice. Not one where I'm thinking about love, but how far would I go for love? How far do you go? Do you give up that moody personality, that arrogant mind, that past you've had? Do you give up what your DNA is constantly hammering at you to to do, the impulse of maybe being angry, resentful, prideful. The real measure of a student in this whole thing called meditation and inner work is about what they're willing to give up, not what they're willing to grasp and hold on to. I hope this little story has helped you in many ways as it has me. We're going to go talk to tension right now. Stay tuned.
Well, we're back here with tension at the uh, Zen Yokoji Center here in, um, well, almost Idlewild, huh? Almost. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. Let's talk about students. Two old teachers. I've been teaching for 40 years yeah. plus. How many of you? Only about 20. Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. older than you. I'm yeah, really the yeah, worst. You're, you're a yeah. young kid. Yeah, I want to snapper. talk about it. Whoa. What do you see when you see students come to you? What kind of students come to you and what are their questions and how do they drive you bananas? Well, that's uh, you, there's a lot. Yeah. That <laughs> you said that. Yeah. I mean, the the first thing is I've got to uh, I try and remember that they're like me. Mm -hmm. You know. And uh, the second thing I, I've got to I've got to talk to myself mm -hmm. first. So I've got to say I'm I'm going to have to be repeating a lot of things for uh, a period of time. So don't don't expect them to pick it up on a you know immediately. Some will, but in the main, I, if I take on a student. Mm -hmm. And it's and I and I feel it's going to work. So I usually give a bit of time now. Then I just resign to that that point. And then um, the students vary obviously in aptitude. It's to, to, to how they're going to you know take to to any sort of discipline. So usually they have talents in certain areas and they have weaknesses in others. So what I try and do is address those weaknesses, and then accentuate the positives. You know, without a, blowing them out of proportion. Well, obviously, yes. As much if as you do put, the, it, put it into context. Yeah, yeah. you got to put it in context because yeah. otherwise they just go berserk. So I want to talk about your father yeah. a little bit. Yeah. I yeah. love the story you told me on the phone when we were getting to know each other about your father because yeah. it fits, you know, the flaw thing that we all yeah. have as human yeah. beings because in Zen we're not trying to be perfect. We're just not. Yeah. So... Tell me about, tell the audience about your father and how he taught you mm, your first lesson in Zen, actually. Well, towards the end of his life, I wanted to, um, to get his take on what it was to be a master. Mm -hmm. In his case, a master carpenter. Mm -hmm. So I asked him that question and he, and he thought for a minute and he goes, a master carpenter is one who makes fe features out of their mistakes. That to and me is Zen. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. when you said that, I knew you knew what the sound of one hand clapping was. Yeah. I knew you knew. It is. It's about making a feature out of a flaw that I have as a human being. Yeah, and the, and the natural way of, yeah. of, of, of life. Yeah. You know? And, and uh, a lot of people, you know, they think that Zen is a thing when actually it's, you know, it's, it's really refined in your life. And through doing that, then mastery occurs, you know, naturally. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I like that. Yeah. Your humor. Mm -hmm. You are a way funny man, and you keep a very light heart. Do you do that with your <laughs> I, students? I have to. Yeah, otherwise <laughs> they'll kill you. Yeah, they they will. They'll literally yeah. kill you. Yeah. So yeah. how do you keep a lightheartedness about your students, and how do you keep them buoyed up, <clears throat> as it were, in the practice with humor? Um, well, I... After a, you know many years of practice, and I hate to admit it, is uh, I really had to ask me myself, uh, wh what's the bottom line? Why are you doing all of this? Mm -hmm. And so I came up with four things. Okay. The Hit first me. thing is uh, I I want to love right people and things because right. I do, and so I've got to practice that okay. if I if I you know really want to make it live. I want to be at peace because. You know, that's what that's what realization, nirvana, or what is in Buddhist terms is for me. Right. That is something to be practiced. It's an ongoing right. thing, practice. Okay. The third thing is I want to enjoy my life because mm. nobody else is going to do that for me. Mm. That's where the humor fits in. I love you your know? humor. Yeah. But, you know, part of it is, again, is that um, uh, we can t I can take things very seriously. Mm hmm um, and it's very important to have that lightness that the living in itself is far more important than the outcome in general, you know. I it's agree. The, it doesn't have to work out in the way that, that I want it to or I, de I demand it. I agree. The important thing is to enjoy and appreciate whatever comes out of it and obviously do the best with that. And the fourth thing is to be of service. To humankind. Yeah. Or, yeah. you know, to the grass, the trees, yes. you know, the, the, whole, the whole lot, wherever, wherever I am. Right. Yeah, so, you know, humor is that there's, there's a lot of it around and that really helps to lighten, uh, you know, the, the so-called load of, of helping people. 
One funny yeah. thing yeah. that you have experienced with student. Give me one. Something that you've experienced and it just cracks you up. Um, had a, uh, a young student, he said, do you have any supernatural powers? And at the time I was doing some rock work just up the way. Mm -hmm. And I said, you see that rock over there? Mm -hmm. And he, he said, uh, he said, yeah. I said, well, move it from there to there. Mm -hmm. And so he picks it up and he moves it over to the other place. I said, see, I can move rocks without even putting my hands on it. <laughs> <laughs> the old Zen story works so well, yeah, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. Well, I thought I invented it. Never no, mind. it's yeah, an old yeah, Zen story, yeah. and I love that you did it. Did he get it? No, you know, I mean, he, you know, he's a, uh, oh. you know, yeah. We're going to come yeah. back to this, man. We'll be right back. These days, all I hear about is people telling me that, you know, they've lost their passion and they need to find their passion and that the thing that's most important in their life is getting what they want and having gotten none of this is true. And, you know, it's very hard for the average person, and I mean average, who is bent and determined on the idea that the meaning of their life comes somehow from the symbolic gestures of other people or obtaining success in some way. And that's just not the way it works. The beauty of what most people are looking for when they begin to look for it is within themselves. If you think about it, my whole genre of thinking, all of my thoughts, are based in some kind of fear. And all I'm trying to do is deflect the fear over and over and over again, and my thoughts start taking on a function of their own and a form of their own until I've lost my whole life to that. And what good is that? That's the way most people live their life. So if you're an imitator, like the little boy was, where you look around you at people and you see the way they live their life, you think, well, I guess that's the way we all live our life. Everybody's doing it. You know what your mother said, if everybody was jumping off a cliff, would you? It's a really good question. We don't individuate very well in this culture. We're so afraid of being out of step with what's cool or right or righteous or whatever it is that is popular. And I have found of late that it is hate that is popular. We've actually disowned our spiritual self. We've disowned what we are intrinsically because we think it's more important for us to be like everyone else. Individuating from the common mediocrity of people thinking that hate is good, that fear saves you, that fear is a good thing. I've heard actually teachers talk about fear being a good thing. I've never found fear to be a good thing in me or as a way of living my life. Awareness, yes. But being afraid, nada. You have to be a certain kind of person to be in an authentic practice. When I was younger, I thought everybody could do it. And I thought everybody wanted to do it. I'm a 60s guy. I'm an old relic. I'm a dinosaur. And I thought everybody wanted to move towards this thing called love. Come to find out that isn't true at all. People just really want to get through. But for those of you who see the light that lives within you ever so faintly, and you realize the importance and the meaning of your life as it reflects love, you will find out inside yourself that you don't need to follow the herd, that this can be something more meaningful, something more profound. I work with young people. I have quite a few young students, and they look at me and they go, all right, what are the mistakes that we could make that would get us into a place where we would be like everyone else? Fear. Caving into fear and then using gratification as a way to make yourself feel better about what you feel. Rationalizing fear. I call it rationalizing my evil. When I do things like that, I take away from the meaning of my life. Just doesn't help. Hey, come to the website at aspire.org. Come take a look at maybe uh, a workshop or a retreat that I have there for you. I work very diligently with my students and I care very much about them and I give them a very potent practice, Tibetan pulsing. It is the art of moving your attention with your breath through your chakras 
and in the background being attuned to certain vibrations of the seven chakras that will resonate inside of you, bringing about clarity, allowing your body and you to harmonize and reconnect with the meaning of your life. And while you're there, go take a look at the catalog section, and there you will see the sound of one hand clapping our new programs here. And uh, maybe you'll find uh, the stories that I have offered here on the program interesting to you. The CDs that accompany this very important series are four of them with uh, two discourses per CD. These are very unique. I talk about Zen, but not in a philosophical way or a religious way. I'm not giving you religion. I am giving you insight. I'm trying to show you how to look at your practice and to cultivate a practice that lets love live you, where I merely step aside and I don't allow the mind to overtake me with impulse. I think you can do that. I think you'll find it very interesting, very meaningful. Listen to the discourses many different times. Consider coming to a workshop or maybe even a retreat with me. They are transformational, believe me. And all of them are there to help you understand not your thinking, but to come to an understanding that is beyond thinking. It is about being in a relationship with the manner of your own spirit. And that is something that is very difficult for most people to consider as real. And yet, I tell you, it is. When you are working on yourself, you are finding energy. And you're finding joy. And you're getting playful. You're finding your creativity is starting to grow. You're less concerned about what is going on in and of the world. But you're still aware of it. But you're starting to look at your life not from a philosophy, but from the direct experience of love. Now you're beginning to understand what it means to stop. To stop your thinking, to stop your worrying, to stop your fear. To stop the hatred inside you, just to stop for a moment and all of a sudden discover that there is an experience inside of you that is trying to happen in and through every moment of your life. Thank you for watching. Please forgive me. The stick. The stick. Don't talk to me about weird. You know that. It's famous. We should get a shot of all these cameras shooting the stick. Yeah. (laughs) It's paparazzi time. Yeah, paparazzi's on the stick.